the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. Practical Psychology for Today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, voiced by David Alt. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. In this edition of the podcast, we will hear selections from The Magic Monastery by Idris Shah. This audio has been made available by the Idris Shah Foundation. Three Epochs 1. Conversation in the 5th century It is said that silk is spun by insects and does not grow on trees. Oh, and diamonds are hatched from eggs, I suppose. Pay no attention to such an obvious lie. But there are surely many wonders in remote lands. It is this very craving for the abnormal in the gullible which produces fantastic invention. Yes, I suppose it is obvious when you think about it, that such things are all very well for the East, but could never take root in our logical and civilised society. 2. In the 6th century A man has come from the East, bringing some small live grubs. Undoubtedly a charlatan of some kind. I suppose he says that they can cure toothache. No, rather more amusing. He says that they can spin silk. He has brought them with terrible sufferings from one court to another, having obtained them at the risk of his very life. This fellow has merely decided to exploit a superstition which was old in my great-grandfather's time. Then what shall we do with him, my lord? Throw his infernal grubs into the fire and beat him for his pains until he recants. These fellows are wondrously bold. They need showing that we're not all ignorant peasants here, willing to listen to any wanderer from the east. Three in the twentieth century. You say that there is something in the East which we have not yet discovered here in the West? Everyone has been saying that for thousands of years. But in this century we'll try anything, our minds are not closed. Now give me a demonstration. You have fifteen minutes before my next appointment. If you prefer to write it down, here's a half sheet of paper. A Sufi of Pamiristan A Sufi from Pamiristan, Khwaja Tufa, was asked why he allowed people to praise him. He said, Some praise, some attack. We have no responsibility for those who praise, any more than we have for those who attack. They are quite independent of us, and do not in any case really heed us. Opposing the heedless is an empty activity. Those who neither praise nor attack us, some of those are people working with us and feeling with us. You do not see them, so you begin to concern yourself with praisers and opposers. This is a sort of bazaar where people are, as it were, buying and selling. The real activity is invisible to you. Looking at praise and attack is looking at irrelevancies. Irrelevancies are often more striking than relevancies. Interesting yourselves in the striking rather than the significant thing is usual but not useful. And do not neglect the address once given by Zil Zilavi when he says, I encourage fools to praise me. When they become extreme in this, they have at last an opportunity to observe the foolishness of fulsomeness. At the same time, those who are sickened by flattery will shun me, thinking that I encourage praise from desire of praise. But if they so lack perception that they can judge only by the surface, I must avoid them, for I am useless to them. The best of all ways of avoiding is to cause that which is to be avoided itself to avoid one of its own desire. Last Day A certain man believed that the last day for humanity would fall on a certain date, and that it should be met in an appropriate manner. 
he gathered around him all who would listen. When the day came, he led them to the top of a mountain. As soon as they had assembled on the summit, their combined weight caused a collapse of its fragile crust, and they were all hurled into the depths of a volcano. It was indeed their last day. Vine Thought Once there was a vine which realized that people came every year and took its grapes. It observed that nobody ever showed any gratitude. One day a wise man came along and sat down nearby. This, thought the vine, is my opportunity to have the mystery solved. It said, Wise man, as you may have observed, I am a vine. Whenever my fruit is ripe, people come and take the grapes away. None shows any sign of gratitude. Can you explain this conduct to me? The wise man thought for a time. Then he said, The reason, in all probability, is that all those people are under the impression that you cannot help producing grapes. Appearances A Sufi said, Such and such a Sufi reads all the books that he can find. A foreign visitor said, Why should he do that, since surely he must have the necessary knowledge already? Because he wishes to couch his teaching in a language such as is being used at this moment, and because he constantly finds in modern books contemporary and arresting analogies with traditional materials. But you do not employ modern analogies, so I assume that you do not read contemporary books, said the visitor. But I do, in fact, read them, all that I can find. Then why do you do so? In order to avoid using current terminology. If I were to use it, people would instantly imagine that I have copied my thoughts from modern books but they do not do so in the case of the man you first mentioned. That is because, although inwardly the same, his outwardness and mine are different. Many people judge only by external appearance. Until they trouble themselves to exercise another capacity, they will be at the mercy of appearance. Total disregard for this fact means that people are placed out of communication with us in reality, and have to depend upon what they can obtain from our outwardness. Disguise Once upon a time, there was a bee who discovered that wasps did not know how to make honey. He thought he would go and tell them, but a wise bee said to him, Wasps do not like bees, and they would not listen to you if you approach them directly since they are convinced, through an age-old conviction, that bees are opposed to wasps. The bee thought about the problem for a long time, and then realized that if he covered himself with yellow pollen, he would look so much like a wasp that they would accept him as one of them. Now, representing himself as a wasp who had made a great discovery, the bee started to teach the wasps honey-making. The wasps were delighted and worked well and hard under his direction. Then there was pause for rest, and the wasps noticed that in the heat of the activity, the disguise had completely worn off the bee, and they recognized him. With one accord they fell on him and stung him to death as an interloper and ancient enemy. And of course, all the half-made honey was abandoned, for was it not the work of an alien? Eating and Wonderment There was once a Sufi who lived alone. He was sought out by a young man who wanted enlightenment, and he allowed him to come to live nearby, and said and did nothing to discourage him. At length, having no teachings and little to think about, the young man said, I have never seen you eating, and I marvel at how you can sustain life without food. Since you joined me, said the Sufi, I have stopped eating in front of you. Now I eat in secret. 
the young man, even more intrigued, said, But why should you do that? If you wanted to deceive me, why should you now confess? I stopped eating, said the sage, so that you might marvel at me, in the hope that you would one day stop marvelling at irrelevancies and become a real student. The young man asked, But could you not have simply told me not to marvel at superficialities? Everyone in the world, said the Sufi, and that includes you, has already been told precisely that, a hundred times at least. Do you imagine that one more handful of words on this subject would have had an effect on you? Picture Law Have you heard about the tragedy of the little pitcher? He heard a thirsty man calling for water from his sick bed in a corner of a room. The pitcher was so full of compassion for the man that by a supreme effort of will, he actually managed to roll within an inch of the sufferer's hand. When the man opened his eyes and saw a pitcher beside him, he was full of wonderment and relief. He managed to pick up the jug and held it to his lips. Then he realized that it was empty. With almost the last remains of his strength, the invalid threw the pitcher against a wall, where it smashed into useless pieces of clay. Exercises It is related that Bahudin Nakshban spoke in this way about exercises. There are three phases of all exercises. In the first, exercises are forbidden. The aspirant is not ready. Exercises would harm him. This is the time when he generally desires exercises most. In the second, when time, place and brethren are suitable for the exercises to have effect, exercises are indicated. In the third, when exercises have had their effect, they are no longer needed. And no master ever performs exercises for his own progress on the way, for all masters have passed the third stage. Nectar The absence of sadness may create bitterness. This saying is illustrated in the tale of the bee. After a long winter she found a flowerbed. Three days later the bee exclaimed, I cannot think what has happened to this nectar. It has become so sour. Absurdities a certain Sufi sent all would-be disciples to hear and write down the harangues of his detractors, who for the most part were narrow-minded scholars. Someone said, Why do you do this? He said, One of the first exercises of the Sufi is to see whether he can perceive the absurdities, partiality and distortions of those who imagine themselves to be men of wisdom. If they can really see through them in this way, descrying their selfish and bitter natures, then the disciples can begin to learn about reality. Onions A man without a sense of smell went to sleep on a bed of onions, wearing a magnificent robe. When he got up, people fled from him in all directions. How lonely is the lot of the aesthete, he lamented. Lacking sensitivity of sight, these people are depriving themselves of something superb. Tokens Visitors to the presence of Jan Fashan Khan were sometimes first welcomed by a man who spoke kind words to them. Then they were regaled with halva. Just before being admitted to see the Khan, a piece of finest yellow gold was presented to them. When they were presented to the teacher, he said, Note the tokens which you have received. In our language they mean, If you want to harm a person, give him flattery, food and money. You can destroy him in this way, while he is fully occupied in thanking you for doing it.
the ass. I know that there will be clover when the weather improves, said the ass, but I want it now. Everyone gets hay. How to solve the problem? I don't know. I'm too busy thinking about the clover. The Method A certain seeker after truth approached one of the disciples of Mosin Ardabili and said, Your master seems to pass his days in taking away from people their ideas and beliefs. How can anything good come of such behavior? The disciple said, The jewel is found after the dirt has been removed from around it. The false jewel is made by applying layer after layer of impure substance, which nonetheless glitters, to any surface at all. The young vine is choked by weeds, yet nobody says, Kill the vine, let the weeds flourish. The wrongdoer tries to throw the mantle of deception over his crime, but no one says, Let the mantle be admired. The seeker after truth said, how can I have been so opaque that these considerations did not penetrate my mind? But why do you not publish these things more widely, so that all may benefit from this high knowledge? It is published every day in the behavior of the wise. It is contained in the books of the saints. It is manifested in tending gardens and making baubles. Do the heedless take notice of anything other than that which will increase their heedlessness? Nuts. A cat said to a squirrel, How wonderful it is that you can so unerringly locate buried nuts to nurture you through the winter. The squirrel said, What to a squirrel would be remarkable would be a squirrel who was unable to do such things. Visitors It is related that a man entered the presence of Gilani and said to him, O oh great sheikh, why do you not see so-and-so, who has read all that you have written, who has discussed your sayings with your companions, and who wishes more than anything to ask such and such a question? Gilani said, If I were to see him, it would be a discourtesy on my part. His question is already answered in my writings, but he has not digested them. But how is this a discourtesy? Surely it is an even greater courtesy to see such a necessitous one, so that you might put him on the right path, if he does not understand your writings. Look out of that window, said Gilani, where those three hundred or so people are waiting. All of them have read the written tracts. Many of them come from far distances. Many have sent in questions and await reception. Would there be no discourtesy to them? How would you feel if you were a worker who had performed a task and, instead of being paid, was kept waiting while a heedless man was given a payment instead of you? While your family waited at home for the breadwinner to return and give them love and the food which he has bought from his own sweat as a day labourer? denying them his company and protection, in order to earn it. This podcast is copyright 2016, the Idrishar Foundation.